This show is brought to you by Ridley College. Hi, I'm Scott Harrower. And I'm Mike Bird. Welcome to the Now and Not Yet. The show where we keep you plugged in to what's happening on Planet Theology. So, Mike, what do you think of when you think of a monk and monasticism? Well, I tend to think of the movie The Name of the Rose with Sean Connery, how he tries to solve a murder mystery in a monk and there's manuscripts and all sorts of things and you're not allowed to laugh. That's what I think of when I think of monks. And what do you think if I said to you the new monasticism? What would a monk look like in today's context? Kind of like, I don't know, maybe a hipster in a monastery with a quill copying, doing his tweets by hand. Uh, I don't know. Well, Mike, there is a new monasticism, and it's very exciting, and it burst into the scenes in about the year 2000. It was a movement, a lay movement, designed to encourage Christians by saying, hey, the monks had all these really cool ideas. We need to take them, tweak them, and put them into practice in our communities, and we'll be better off as Christians together. Okay, so is it like these spiritual disciplines or the spiritual value of doing monk-like stuff? It is. It is. It's... Um, saying, I am better off if I get into a good pattern of committing to people around me, committing to read the scriptures, committing to a cycle of prayer and to ongoing prayer. I'm better off if I commit myself to doing something good for the world and something good for the people around me. And Lord, as we feel the gentle sunlight, we're reminded that you are the God of light. The gentle breeze, Lord, reminds us of that breath with which you imbue all things, moving us, consoling us, gently guiding us to know and love you and all creatures. We praise you, Lord, for this garden. Ah! Um, so a friend of mine, for example, they're committed to Moabit, which is uh, part of Berlin. Yeah. And together with eight other families, they live there, they have a house church, and they try to make a difference in their community. And together, as a group, they pray, they read the scriptures, they help each other out in all sorts of practical ways. They share property and, yeah. um, and so forth. So it's a, it's a dedicated community okay. that wants to, I guess, live something like the life that we see in Acts 2.42 and following. It, is this, is this kind of rehearsing like the Jesus people from the 1970s, which were kind of like hippies with a Christian twist? Is, yes. is, is, this, is this rehearsing that kind of a thing, but in, in a newer way? Yes, it is very much so um, rehearsing that, but it's doing so with an interest to dig into the wisdom of the past. Oh, so whereas yes. the Jesus movement is wanting to get close to Jesus and his uh, disciples, this movement is wanting to dig into, you know, the year 200 to 1200. Yep. And, and sort of get the gems from there. Give that back! That's mine! Give it back! So you might hear about the new monastic communities and say to yourself, mate, this is just way too hard. Let me assure you, it's not. You can take on some insights from the new monasticism in short bursts. That's what I've been doing for the last decade by participating in monastic community retreats in Germany. These are short bursts for spiritual refreshment. Let me explain. So what happens is every day, a couple of people will pray about their life, their ministry, their finances, their family. Yeah. We'll hear the story. And then the group gives you some wisdom. And then you walk away from that meeting with some reflections from them that might help you develop in all those areas. Yeah. Later on in the day, they will pray for you meaningfully. Um, that cycle is repeated over a few days. And then what happens is, you'll start to notice in your retreat that strands and themes become more and more common. And then the leader of the retreat will work with those strands and those themes and reflect on them theologically in terms of what God might be doing in our own group with those themes, yep. how God might work with those themes in our own native contexts, and how we might develop the communities around us in our own themes. It's a pretty good setup. So if you're from like a low church tradition, maybe you're a brethren in the UK, Sydney Anglican or Southern Baptist, mm. is, is this something you think people could experiment with in a way of rejuvenating their own spiritual journey? I, I think it does rejuvenate your spiritual journey because there's a pattern of meaningful, dedicated prayer, scripture reading in the company of other Christians whom you trust and with whom you can be open. And you can trust that their feedback will be the kind of feedback that's aimed at your discipleship. So it, it, is, it can be very healthy. I've had a very positive 
experience of it and I'd recommend it to all as long as it's done with the idea that this time of refreshment and input isn't for my sake it's for the sake of others. Okay, well that sounds very interesting. Something worth exploring if you want to find new ways to grow in your faith, your discipleship, and what it means to be part of God's people. <laughs> it's now the part of our show where we send out some love. And today we want to say Yoda one for me to Queen Elizabeth II, the monarch of England and the head of state of Australia, New Zealand, and many places in the British Empire. We want to send her some special greetings, don't we, Scott? Yes, happy 90th birthday. Yes, 90. Now, I don't know what you're planning to do at 90, but ruling a country is probably not on the top of most people's list. But I think the Queen is great. Her annual Christmas speech every year, it's full of Christian themes and compassion. She is a great leader. And this is why I feel sorry for Americans, because they got rid of the monarchy. Mm. And look at the presidents they've had in recent years. I think they picked some pretty poor choices. To, to my American friends, I say, put the tea back on the boat. You know, she's, a, she's, a, she's a, like in charge of the Anglican Church. Yep. She's the sovereign. And you could have Queen, not, not just as your ruler, as the head of your church, because she is the supreme governor of the Church of England. You could have some of that too. That's exactly what I think you should have. Isn't that right, Scott? Absolutely. God save the Queen. God save the Queen indeed. The press. Whoa, whoa, oh, ouch, 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 Bernie's, Bernie's, Bernie's. And here I've got a great book by Bruce Longnecker called The Cross Before Constantine. Now let me explain something of the context. It's often assumed that the cross never really became a central symbol of the Christian faith until after Constantine. You know, before that time, it was bread and loaves or bread and wine or Jesus as the shepherd. Mm. And the fixation of the cross is something that happened much later. Mm. And it was part largely of the medieval church with their focus on death and torture and cruel the truth. Yeah, the bad men. Yeah. They're the ones who got over-enthusiastic about the cross. Instead, we should be more about the shepherd and loaves yeah, and fishes. That's more that, cuddly. That's yep, more cuddly. Yep, that is a myth, and that myth is busted majorly. Bruce Longnecker goes through literary evidence, archaeological evidence, and he shows while the cross wasn't the only symbol that was prominent, it was certainly a lot more prominent than that. And he does a great case of, of looking at things like evidence from, you know, the book of Revelation, where people are marked with a particular sign. He thinks he can show or, or, or insinuate that that was a sign of the cross. And stuff in Justin Martyr and Tertullian. And, but then he does some other stuff too. Longnecker claims that he can find evidence for the veneration or the use of the cross as a symbol in places like Pompeii. You know, Pompeii, which was, you know, obliterated when Mount Vesuvius exploded in 79 AD. That's very early. That's very early. So Christian refugees fled the Roman persecution under Nero, went to Pompeii, established Christian communities and places like bakeries. He thinks he can find uh, some Christian symbology, including a, a cross. Now, some of it's a little bit more persuasive than other strands. Wait, did you say bakeries? Bakeries, that's what so I said. So hot cross buns? Hot cr well, maybe not hot Pompeii. cross, maybe not hot cross buns, but you know, the cross is a symbol on a wall in a bakery, that mm. type of thing. And he goes through all the various things, signet rings, like I said, literary evidence, catacombs, it is cracker lacking. This is a book that busts a very big myth, and that makes the best kind of book. I should say, uh, Longnecker also has a follow-up book coming out soon, uh, which is specifically on the cross in Pompeii. That's the more contentious nature of his claims, so that there's more coming out. So if you're into archaeology or anything like that, don't forget to get into this book, Bruce Longnecker, The Cross Before Constantine. So it's like Mythbusters, but for New Testament studies. Exactly. But now and not yet. And that's the end of the show for this week. I'm Scott Harrower. I'm Mike Bird. This is the Now and Not Yet. Don't forget to like our page and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.